Hello, everyone. Let's talk about Jesus. Who is Jesus? Um, many times uh, we Christians are asked some pretty difficult questions, and many do not know how to answer. And so my prayer is that whether you are a Christian and you're watching this movie, or maybe you are an unbeliever and you're just curious, um, who is Jesus? Um, especially, especially having seen all the unprecedented things that are happening around the world, uh, you want to find out, okay, well, maybe, maybe I need to look into this Jesus. Um, I need to understand what it is that these Christians are talking about. Or why is it that this name has um, lived on for thousands of years with uh, uh, people who hold fast a belief in Christ and his salvation? And so my aim toward this is not only a believer, but if you're an unbeliever, maybe you're lukewarm with one leg in the world and, and one leg weakly in Christ. Maybe um, you're just uh, an individual who is uncertain what they believe. Um, whatever the reason is, I pray that this, that this video will help you understand the power uh, behind a belief in Christ, in Jesus. In the Messiah, yes, of the Jewish people, but the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world on another uh, um, perspective. He is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And what I want to show you is the unimaginable power behind his name. Um, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is a reason why for um, thousands of years, even though there has been great persecution against the people of God, whether we're talking about the Jewish people or the Christians, there have been such great persecution, you would have thought that they would have been obliterated by now, but yet they exist. Why? Um, so I, I, my prayer is to enlighten many of you and also to give you a reason um, why I believe, uh, as well as others, so that you understand um, we're not believing in a fairy tale. Um, God is real, Jesus is real, the Holy Spirit is real, and there is a reason why throughout the ages his, lay, his name lives on in his people. Um, so first let's begin with prayer. Father Almighty God, I thank you so much for this day and for every person that has tuned in to listen. And I just pray, Father, whether they're listening or watching from wherever they're at around the world, I pray, Father, that you give them all eyes to see and ears to hear only your truth away from the lies and the confusion of the world and the enemy. In Jesus' name, by the power of his blood and by his spirit, Lord, I just pray that you bring them understanding. Holy Spirit, take complete control. I pray that it is God's truth, not mine, that I share today. I pray, Father, that you guard my tongue and let it be, Father, to edify, to enlighten, to just give these people a reason for the blessed hope that is in me and many others. In Jesus' name, place your hedge of protection around each and every one of us. And I pray, Father, that you keep out the devices, the lies, the confusion of the enemy in Jesus' name, by the power of his blood and by his spirit. And all God's children say, amen. Okay, so let's talk about Jesus. You know, in 1 Peter 3.15, the Bible says, always be prepared, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have, which is Christ. Um, in John 1, 29, it says, this is talking about John the Baptist who prepared the way for the Messiah, for the Jewish people. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And in John 1, 36, it says, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Why is Jesus called the Lamb of God? Um, we're going to visit that in a moment. But before I go further, I want to let you know, if you're an unbeliever who has somehow stumbled upon this video and you felt compelled to view it, even though you don't believe in Jesus, but you genuinely, a, a curiosity has sparked in you, understand that there is an unseen realm. And the living God sees the heart of every human being on earth. 
And there must have been something the Lord has seen in your heart that he thought you worthy to bring you, to present you his son. Because the Bible says that no one can come to Jesus except the, the father draw him. And there is something that the Lord has seen in, inside the heart of every believer, every person that calls themselves a follower of Jesus Christ. There is something about your heart the Lord has seen. And so he is drawing you. There is a reason you feel compelled. And I just pray that you view this video all the way to the end, because I, I promise you, you will leave um, not the same as you came in. And so I pray that God will bless you with an understanding that you didn't have before through this video. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what we read here. The website got questions for those of you that have many questions and that seek the word of God. I do trust them. They speak um, based in sound doctrine. Uh, uh, when they have their writings, they speak through their writings. And I, I like to refer to them every now and then because I think they give a sort of synopsis um, to what I may make lengthy. <laughs> and so, and it is based in sound doctrine and they do have and provide the verses um, that will help you understand what they're saying and refer to the, to the verses so you can do your own study. So I like them very much. And here, the question that was posed is, what does it mean that Jesus is the Lamb of God? And so here we're going to read, when Jesus is called the Lamb of God in John 1 29 and John 1 36, it is referring to him as the perfect and ultimate sacrifice for sin. In order to understand who Jesus was and what he did, we must begin with the Old Testament, which contains prophecies concerning the coming, the coming of Christ as a guilt offering, according to Isaiah 53 10. In fact, the whole sacrificial system established by God in the Old Testament set the stage for the coming of Jesus Christ, who is the perfect sacrifice God would provide as atonement for the sins of his people. You can refer to Romans 8, 3 and Hebrews 10. You know, Jesus is so much more. Not only do we read that he is the son of the living God, the only begotten, but we read that he is the word of God, the word of God of which God speaks things into existence with, and he was made flesh. Um, we, we, we come to understand that the Old Testament spoke of Jesus by way of a mystery. You gotta understand when he manifested on the earth and was born on the earth in the flesh, when he came into a human body prepared for him, he himself had been spoken of hundreds of years before he manifested on the earth um, because the Bible says that he existed from the beginning. And so there is something about Jesus that even his enemies in ancient writings did write about him. If we are enemies of someone, someone of status, are they going to write about us? You know, there is something about Jesus that even his enemies did write about him. So we continue write, reading uh, from Got Questions website. The sacrifice of lambs played a very important role in the Jewish religious life and sacrificial system. When John the Baptist referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of, of the world in John 1 29, the Jews who heard him might have immediately thought of any one of several important sacrifices. With the time of the Passover feast being very near, the first thought might be the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. The Passover feast was one of the main Jewish holidays and a celebration in remembrance of God's deliverance of the Israelites from bondage in Egypt. In fact, the slaying of the Passover lamb and the applying of the blood to doorposts of the houses in Exodus 12, 11 to 13, is a beautiful picture of Christ's atoning work on the cross. Those for whom he died are covered by his blood, protecting us from the angel of death, spiritual death. Remember that the Bible speaks of a second death, a permanent death that speaks of eternity. Um, we continue in God questions. Another important sacrifice involving lambs was the daily sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem. Every morning and evening, a lamb was sacrificed in the temple for the sins of the people, according to Exodus 29, 38, 42, 38 to 42. These daily sacrifices, like all others, were simply to point people toward the 
perfect sacrifice of Christ on the cross. In fact, the time of Jesus' death on the cross corresponds to the time that evening, the evening sacrifice was being made in the temple. The Jews at that time would have also been familiar with the Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah and Isaiah, who foretold the coming of one who would be brought like a lamb led to the slaughter, according to Jeremiah 11, 19 and Isaiah 53, 7, and whose sufferings and sacrifice would provide redemption of Israel. Of course, that person was none other than Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And it's important to note that the prophecies of the Bible, of which one third of the Bible is prophecy, is prophetic, um, speak of a lamb. In the book of Revelation, you'll see the lamb referred to. And the Bible um, does interpret itself. And we know that the lamb is Jesus. So it is indicative of Jesus. It is representative of Jesus. When we look, when we look at the book of Revelation, Revelation itself means unveiling. And there is a lot of symbol, symbolism used in the prophecies of the book of Revelation. And it cannot be ignored that it is the Bible that will help you interpret that last book, the revelation of the risen, resurrected, glorified Jesus Christ. And so we continue reading in God Questions. While the idea of a sacrificial system might seem strange to us today, the concept of payment or restitution is still one we can easily understand. We know that the wages of sin is death and that our sin separates us from God. We also know that the Bible teaches we are all sinners and none of us is righteous before God. Because of our sin, we are separated from God and we stand guilty before him. Therefore, the only hope we can have is if he provides a way for us to be reconciled to himself. And that is what he did in sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Christ died to make atonement for sin and to pay the penalty of the sins of all who believe in him. You know, God is not a dictator. He is going to ask you, do you want what I'm offering you? Do you want this free gift? And you have a choice. You accept it or you reject it. But understand, rejecting the free gift, rejecting the protection and righteousness of Christ that you put on as a human being that, that protects you and seals you with the Holy Spirit of God and, and the Holy Spirit of God comes and indwells inside your body, gives you spiritual eyes to see and spiritual ears to hear wisdom from above when you read the Bible. The Bible, which itself has wisdom from above in it because holy chosen men of God spoke as the Holy Spirit of God gave them utterance. There is wisdom from above in the Holy Bible. It has information in it that even the scientists didn't know until later on. You know, the, the, the universe we learned, I don't know how many decades, decades ago, decades being 10, 10 years ago or so, 10, 20 years ago or so, um, the universe is expanding. You know, in the Bible, the Lord says that he is the one that stretches out the heavens. You know, the, there is information in the Bible that cannot be ignored, that is known on another level, that some of which scientists didn't find out till sometime in our decade or century. And so we cannot ignore the wisdom that only God, only God in his almighty, all-knowing, um, um, omniscient self, he understands and knows things like we don't. We are limited. You know, even the spectrum of light is limited to our eyes. There are certain colors or, or, or um, color schemes that we cannot see, that our eyes cannot handle, that we cannot, our eyes cannot interpret. I'm not sure how to verbally put this, but it is scientifically proven. We have limitations as human beings, but God has no limitations. We cannot try to put God in a box because the Bible says that his ways are higher than our ways. And so it's important that we um, understand our place when it comes to the creator of all, which more and more as time goes on, his truth is not only being revealed 
as far as understanding the Bible and the prophecies in it, but as well as science, we are beginning to see the truth of intelligent design. We're beginning to see how it is that the Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God. You know, there have been people who have, and you'll see in a little bit quotes from them, that they are in um, brilliant positions, those with brilliant, the brilliant of my, of, you know, the most brilliant of minds on earth. Um, we have uh, astrophysicists, we have uh, those people that can think in numbers. And let me tell you, they started off their field as an atheist, and many of them have turned Christian from what they saw in the heavens, from what they, they studied and researched that they could no longer deny intelligent design. So let me tell you what you're going to be confronted with in this world. You're going to be confronted with unbelievers. You're going to be confronted with people who have made Satan their father and they hate Jesus and they hate those who belong to Jesus and they want everything you say and discover to be a lie no matter how much you tell them there's there's proof um, no matter how you show it to them uh in a rational way it does not matter um a liar will always lie how can i put this so that it's not um it doesn't sound uh like i'm making it up those who and i'm sure you've met people like that you know you put yourself in a in a classroom and and even in high school, you know, these are kids we're talking about, but let's say college. And, and even with people who consider themselves of status, if there is some group that they don't like, um, because hate exists in all flavors, if there is a group that they don't like, right? Uh, maybe they're rich and they're looking and, and looking down at people who are poor. Maybe they don't have the name brand stuff on, whatever it is, those people you find that are of higher status will always talk negative about those that they can't stand. They don't want to know anything about the poor. There are many people like that. I'm not saying all rich people, please don't misunderstand me. But there is a certain thinking pattern that people um, will always down talk that group that they don't like. Um, look at prejudice, with, which is an ugly thing that exists, even though every human being will go through the same metamorphosis when they're six feet under. Yet there are those who, who hate a certain class. No, not, and they'll call themselves Christian. There are many people who call themselves Christians who, who exercise prejudice, who are prejudiced against a certain race. Well, you know, you need to remind them it was God that, that confused the languages. They are still God's people, though they have a different language. And so unfortunately, in this world, hate exists. Satan has been busy, understand. He existed before a human being existed. And guess what? He has been busy. Yes, he has been busy. And he has been spreading lies, spreading sin. Um, if, you, if you think back um, at the t during the time of Jesus, and you think back now, how less holy people are, how more sin is seen as acceptable or tolerable, how the times that we're living in are slowly resembling the times of Saddam and Gomorrah, the times of the great flood. Understand that if God came down and punished them and, and we are promised in the word of God from the God who does not lie, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we're promised that another global judgment is coming. This is a big one. This is a big one. He's going to allow evil incarnate for seven years to deal with the people that are on the earth for that time. But the blessed church, the faithful church will not be here. And I would refer you to the rapture series, particularly um, rapture series part three on the pre-tribulation rapture, which I will try to link in the description area. So there is a reason. God is a God of order. There is too much proof of God. It would take a lot more faith in atheism not to believe in God. It would take a lot more twisting and bending of the truth not to believe in God, because more and more we're beginning to see proof of God in every area of things that are tangible and that will reach a person even outside of the Bible. But let me tell you this, the Holy Bible is where you will learn the instruction 
in righteousness. That's where you'll learn the character of God. That's where you'll learn the truth of God, the instruction manual for every human being. I believe with all my heart that the Holy Bible is so powerful, just as it says, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce and divide asunder between soul and spirit. What does that mean? It can reach the deepest level of a human being where any surgical tool cannot reach and divide asunder between the soul and the spirit of a human being, which human eyes cannot see themselves. The word of God is like a seed we read. And when planted on good ground, it will bear fruit. It has the power to sanctify, to set somebody apart as holy unto God. It trans transforms an individual from the inside out. How is it that you see these Christians and they see a certain way and they hear a certain way and they understand the word of God in a way that no man who does not have the Holy Spirit of God can understand? And so I need, to, I need to let you know there is power. There is power in believing Jesus. There is power over the unseen forces that also exist, though you don't want to believe in them. Listen, um, demonic possession, a very taboo subject sometimes, is real. And there are credible cases of it throughout the world as there were in the Bible. And you have to understand there is an unseen realm that though you find it scary or hard to believe in it, it exists. It doesn't matter that you want to believe in it or not. What matters is, are you protected by God? Do you have the seal of God in the unseen that has you protected so that the enemy doesn't consider you fair game? The enemy of humanity right now is spreading sin, spreading hate, and doing so many things to influence those that are unprotected into doing his bidding, to blind them spiritually. Listen, Jesus Christ has said it this way. There is a path of destruction. It's wide, and many will go that way. But there is a path a straight gate and narrow way that leads to life, eternal life with him in heaven. And he said, few will find it. It's important that you understand that today, Satan has established a system that is meant for your destruction. But God has provided a way, him being the creator of all, Satan being a created being, God has provided a way that you will be sealed and filled with such power, the power of the Holy Spirit, in order for you to succeed as an overcomer. The children of God have been given power over all the powers of the enemy. They have been promised victory through Christ. They have been filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And they have been given power. They're told whatsoever they loose in heaven shall be loosed on earth. Whatsoever they bind shall be bound. Listen, 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 listen. There's something about being a born again Christian that is different. But understand that within our walk as Christians, we are going to experience resistance from those who have made Satan their father. Because he does not want people to stay on the straight gate. Uh, toward, walking toward the straight gate and narrow way. He wants people to come to the wide gate. Why? Because when he gets his seven years, he is going to enjoy destroying every one of those people and sealing them to him so that they share his fate. I have read the Holy Bible. Thousands of prophecies have already come to be and countless others are still aligning themselves seemingly to come into fruition in our time. Please do not ignore that we are given, we are living in a time that is called the church age of grace, the acceptable year of the Lord, where Jesus Christ has opened his arms on the cross and he says, believe in me and I will save you. I will save you from sin. I will save you from death. I will save you from the judgment that's coming. 
but many people reject it, not understanding that then they have made themselves fair game for the enemy in his playground. He will blind you spiritually. He will convince you to act in hate. He will convince you to do his bidding. And then if you are here during the seven year period on the earth that has the great tribulation in it, he will seal you to him. And then that's it. There's no more chance. When you are sealed to Satan, you will follow him because a sentence, is, a sentence of death is already on his head. After everything is said and done, he will be cast eternally into the lake of fire. That's according to the word of God. The word of God, the Holy Bible, written by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who does not lie and does not change, who said what he has spoken through his word will come to be. And so far, his track record for prophecies fulfilled is really spot on. So let's continue reading and got questions. It is through his death on the cross, Jesus' death on the cross is what we're talking about, as God's perfect sacrifice for sin and his resurrection three days later, that we can now have eternal life if we believe in him. The fact that God himself has provided the offering that atones for our sin is part of the glorious good news of the gospel that is so clearly declared in 1 Peter 1, 18 to 21. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without spot, without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 2,000 years ago, Jesus spoke those words. And he said primarily, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way to the presence and throne of God but by me, through me. You know, we read in Matthew 7, 13, and 14, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth to li unto life and few there be that find it. Um, there is a path. The Lord has established a path, how we are to live. It's not about a work salvation. We are saved through faith by grace. But there is a way that is acceptable as a standard of God, and there's a way that is not acceptable as a standard of God. Um, if you are those who want to do what you want to do, and you want to listen to, to Satan and what he suggests and to fulfill your flesh and, you know, hate and kill and, and, and do all these things, just live freely um, any which way you want. Remember that the people of God, they're to keep their bodies holy. Because these holy, these bodies rather, excuse me, have become the temple of God, the holy temple of God that houses the Holy Spirit in it, of which blasphemy against is unforgivable. Forgivable. And so there are things that the Bible declares will keep you from the kingdom of heaven. We'll go and read and research all the things that the Lord has said, of which if you partake in them, not only are you an abomination to him, but people who, excuse me, for example, have become friends with the world, um, who have conformed to the ways of the world, the Lord said, is an enemy of God. I wouldn't ignore that. You know, there are things that the Bible says uh, in Revelation 22, I believe it is, Jesus gives a very serious warning. Those who add or take away from the book of Revelation, there are consequences. Um, many of them will, be, will, will, will partake of the plagues written in the book of Revelation. Go and study what happens in the seven seals, seven thunders, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Um, uh, go and, and study and research every detail of everything that would happen. We're told that that seven-year period where evil incarnate will walk the earth, we're told that that will be the worst time ever. 
that people will seek death and not find it. So those cast into that time, which Luke 21 calls days of vengeance and wrath, which the Lord has, has reserved for his enemies and adversaries, I'm telling you, it's going to be a bad time on earth. You're going to wish that this age of grace was back again, that you can say, never mind, I accept Jesus now, but it's going to be too late. You know, Jesus said that, he said in uh, John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. There's a recompense we read about in Luke that is called the resurrection of the just. If you have not heard about the rapture, um, I would like to refer you to the rapture series uh, that I have on this channel, which begins with what is the rapture? In John 14, Jesus has promised to come for those his to take them to that place at his father's house that he has prepared for them. Um, when we understand that the Father's house is not on the earth, according to Isaiah, and when we understand that um, the event that Jesus spoke of in John 14, saying that he will come to take us to that place at his Father's house that he has prepared for us, is an event that John 14 also says is when Jesus will manifest unto us and not unto the world. And for those of you who are serious in study of eschatology, you know that the second coming, however, is an event where every eye will see. So John 14, hands down, is speaking of the rapture, the resurrection of the just. And that is a recompense, a reward. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection. You know, we learned that he is the only door by which we enter into the presence and throne of God. He said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pastor. You know, in John 1, 1 through 8, we read that Jesus is the word of God. When you think about the word of God, which is no lie and is the truth, of which Jesus himself said he is the truth, we cannot ignore that back in the day, 2,000 years ago, it was a very bit different time than the one we see today. And we know that a lot of ugly times have happened in between. Meanwhile, Satan keeps on with his lies, keeps on with confusion, keeps on blinding many spiritually. He doesn't want you to be saved. He doesn't want you to have an opportunity. He wants to have his claws in you come the seven-year period. He wants you cast into the seven-year period because he's a liar and he's a murderer from the beginning and he takes pleasure in those things. And so many people who have made Satan their father, they don't understand what awaits them in, their, in, in the last day of their last breath. When they take their last breath in this temporary existence that they may have um, sold their souls to receive uh, material pleasures that satisfy and gratify the flesh, they have no idea that at the last day of their breath, their eternal existence, which is way longer than this temporary existence, belongs to Satan. When you make a covenant with death, hell, and the grave, that is what you're going to receive. Satan can promise you all the things in the world for after you take your last breath, but here's the problem. He has no control for what happens to you after your last breath. The Bible says that your spirit, your soul, come back to the one who gave it. Satan is not the creator of all. He is a created being. The creator of all gets your soul back in his hands. And he decides your fate based upon what you did with this life that he has given you while incarnate on this earth. And many who have made the enemy of humanity, their father, have been lied to and blinded. And they have no idea that whatever deal they made for this temporary existence that the Bible says is but a vapor of smoke compared to eternity. They have no idea that at the last day of their, of their breath, the last day that they are here on earth after their last breath, they go to Satan. And Satan is already a defeated foe. He's already sentenced. He's already going to be cast into the lake of fire. So that person suffers eternally. I would recommend that you 
look at the various accounts of people who have died and come back having gone to hell. Listen, I have seen testimony after testimony of credible witnesses who died an atheist and came back a Christian because only God can do that. And they were given a second chance to go and testify and tell human beings what they saw on earth. And it's horrible. I've, I've studied many of those um, near-death testimonies. And let me tell you something. Time and time again, the repeated thing that I hear is that the dead will tell the person who was given an opportunity to glimpse, go and tell my family, please, to change. They don't want to come down here. It's eternal suffering. It's suffering over and over and over again. And there are different levels of hell. Go and look at those cases. Why do I believe in them? You'll see in a little bit. See, if somebody were to ask me, why do you believe? My goodness, why do you not believe? There's more proof about the power of God on the earth more than ever in this time that we're living in. And I truly believe it's because we're down to the last moments of the last days. There are, God works in an order. You know, in Ephesians 1.10, the Bible says that there are dispensation of fullness of times. There are segments of times in an order. Right now, we're in the acceptable year of the Lord. We're in the church age of grace. Um, the Lord has basically told you, come to me. You know, he's giving where before back in the day, it was only the people of Israel that were the people of God. The Lord has opened his arms wide on the cross and said, I'm going to be giving you a time of grace. This is a time unprecedented. I'm going to give you an opportunity to come to me. I'm not a dictator. I'm not going to force myself on you. I'm going to tell you, I love you. I died for you. Accept this free gift because I want to save you from what's coming. There's a judgment coming. It's a global judgment. I have studied it and I will be releasing a, a, a video with that um, uh, description of that seven year time that is approaching. You know, Jesus gave us signs so that we know that time is approaching. So there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be earthquakes in diverse places. There will be plagues and pestilence. Um, the, the things will begin to happen and escalate as they're happening. You know, we look at Israel. Um, we look at Jerusalem that everybody's fighting over. That's also prophetic. We look at Damascus, Syria, Syria I'm sorry, Damascus, Syria. And we, we, we know that that is one of the oldest inhabited um, cities of the world, and today it is two third a ruinous heap. Um, the Bible says that it will stop from being a city; it will become a ruinous heap. It's two third a ruinous heap today. Go and look at the images. You know, there's something about the Bible that is unlike anything ever written, unlike any ancient manuscript ever written. There is something about God and everything that He left us, so that we may know about Him you know, so that we may learn about him, so that we may have an opportunity to escape that time coming. And I'm telling you, it's in the word of God and the word of God is true. And he has shown us time and again. Um, that why do I believe? Because I have seen proof of God. I know me in my younger years as an, you know, as, as somebody who was not born again. And I know me today oh my goodness, I'm, I'm, I'm so different. I see differently. I understand differently. Um, I love more deeply. I, I have more compassion toward people. Listen, when you become a child of God, you resemble the fruits of the Holy Spirit. You know, and I, I'm sorry that I didn't include that here. I will try to remember to include it in the description area. When you have a, a true born again Christian, because let me tell you something, unfortunately, as Satan has been busy, there are many false Christians. There are many um, wolves in sheep's clothing, the Bible says. False preachers, false teachers. And they're meant to confuse unbelievers. Listen, if an unbeliever sees Christians arguing among themselves, so-called Christians arguing among themselves, why would anybody want to be a part of that? Then Satan has succeeded in tearing people away from uh, the truth, from the, from the belief in God, because he doesn't want you to be saved. He wants you to join him in hell so he can torture you because he takes pleasure in that. You want to be saved. Let me continue. So in John 1, 1 through 8, we read, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. 
and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, John was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, the people of Israel, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to him that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. John bear witness of him and cried saying, this was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me for he was before me and of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Jesus is not only the son of the living God, one part in the fullness of God, but he is also the word of God. And what he has spoken, what he has spoken, we read Jesus said that the words that he speaks, they are spirit and they are life. Peter told us that the words that Jesus speaks are the words of eternal life. There is something about the word of God that cannot be ignored, that there is so much power in it. There is power in the name of Jesus Christ. Go and research credible cases. Listen, the liars in this world who follow the father of lies, they don't want you to come to truth. So it doesn't matter if you tell them that one plus one is two, they will play on words and confuse you just as the serpent confused Eve and try to convince you that that truth that you have come across is a lie. Let me tell you this. If you want to learn about Jesus, learn about him from somebody that knows him, not from somebody that hates him. Uh, those that do not know Christ have no business talking about him or his truth. You need the Holy Bible. I'm sorry, you need the Holy Spirit to understand the Holy Bible. If those people who hate Jesus try to tell you and correct you about a truth that you have come across, you have a decision to make, my friend. You can either believe the holy living God who is the creator of all, or you can believe the ones who hate Jesus who have lies and lies and more lies and the liar backing them up. You can either believe the people of God who know Jesus intimately as children of God, filled with God's spirit, or you can believe those whose only aim is to get you on their side toward the wide gate and broad way that leads toward destruction. Many people have choices to make, and the time of having a choice is now. Now, before the seven year comes, because those seven years are going to be very dark, very scary, very ugly, uglier than anything you have ever seen on earth, worse than the great flood, worse than Saddam and Gomorrah. Think of the worst time on earth that you remember in reading in history, worse than that. So we read in Romans 8 the following, but if the Spirit, speaking of the Holy Spirit, capital S, of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. You know, over and over again, Jesus demonstrated that he could raise the dead. When he took his last breath on the cross, my, he raised many a dead. That is the power of God to raise the dead. And still many people doubt and still many people don't believe. In this video, I'm going to show you clips of people within our, the last decade that have died and after prayer, after 45 minutes dead, they came back to life. 
There is power in the name of Jesus, even still today in raising the dead. God is still in the business of miracles. Don't let anybody convince you otherwise. Where is your faith? Faith is a funny thing. Um, faith means belief, trust, and fidelity in Christ. Um, when people say they have faith, many times they don't understand what they're saying. Because the minute that bad things happen, they begin to focus and make the bigger problems, the problems bigger than God. If you say you have faith in Christ, you believe what the Bible says about him, that he is seated above all and he has all under his feet, that he has been given authority in heaven and earth, that he is um, the one that is the word of God, which is true. And what he said, you will either believe or not believe, but you cannot say you have faith if you don't believe what he said. That's a, a walking contradiction. God has said, the Lord Jesus Christ has, has told us who is the word of God. He has told us that the children of God who have the Holy Spirit in them, they have been given power over all the powers of the enemy. They have been given power to bind and to loosen on the earth. The spirits, the demonic lying spirits that the enemy sends to a Christian, they have power to bind them, uproot them, and cast them out in Jesus' name. Many Christians have been led to a bed of confusion by false prophets, false teachers, and wolves in sheep's clothing, those filled with pride, who are not teaching the people of God how to put on the whole armor of God and how to walk in kingdom promises as children of the living God, filled with the Holy Spirit in them, which is greater than the one in the world. So it's important that you understand, child of God, who you are in Christ and who it is that you have in you and the power that you are walking on this earth with. You know, James 4.14 4 says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. This life that we're living, this existence as a human, is temporary. Every one of us, one day, will take our last breath. And then the eternal parts, which is our soul and our spirit, it will go somewhere. And depending on who you made your father on earth, that's who you will go with eternally. Hell is a place of suffering, everyday suffering, every day um, um, uh, being tormented. It's, it's, I'm telling you, please listen to the testimonies of those who have died and come back, having visited hell, that were allowed to come back, that clinically they were dead. They were pronounced dead and they came back. Somebody prayed and they came back. You know, there are, there are credible stories throughout the world. And when you um, compare in contrast what every one of those people who visited hell have said, my goodness, the, the similarities of everything that they've said um, can only be a testimony of something they truly saw. And we're allowed to come back and tell the tale so that people will not want to go to that place, so that people understand Jesus is trying to save you from that, save you from sin, save you from death, save you from the global judgment that is coming. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, we read the following. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, this is um, Paul speaking, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. But I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. Some are fallen asleep. You know, Paul was telling them at the time that he told them, go and seek for yourself. There are over 500 witnesses. Tell them, ask them, so that they can tell you they saw him come back to life. Then we continue reading. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. You know, Paul used to be called Saul. And he was um, 
a, a, a Jew who was persecuting the Christian people. And he had a lot of bloodshed in his hands. He, he um, didn't care if it was woman, child. Um, if you were a Christian, you were breaking the law and he was going to hand down sentence. He, because of him, many people perished. But he had an encounter with Christ, a very powerful encounter. And Jesus um, manifested to him and, and called to him and said, why are you persecuting me? You know, that's always intrigued me because he didn't say, why are you persecuting my people? He said, why are you persecuting him? Because as you study scripture, you will learn that the people of God are part of his body, part of his flesh and bones. And when you are hurting them, you are hurting Christ. And he doesn't see them as separate of him. They are his. We become his purchased possession. And we, we don't, this is not a cult, understand. There are cults that exist. This is us following our creator. This is us wanting to follow our creator, seeing and, and feeling the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth in his word. And so there is a powerful reason why many of us believe what we do. It's not that we're blinded, though the enemy of humanity has been busy and to discredit us, many false Christians exist. Many of those that pretend to be Christian, that have merged Christianity with pagan ways. There are so many things, so many lies, so many wrong ways, and there is only one right way. So in Revelation 1-3, we read the following. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. The book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation literally means unveiling. And it is a book that we are promised blessings for hearing and reading. But it, it, all, it is also a book that in Revelation 22, Jesus himself gives a warning for those who try to take away or add to anything from it or to it. Um, so we have to be really careful how we read the book of Revelation. You know, the Bible is one third prophetic. Um, it is one, about one third of it is prophecy. We read the following. Why is Bible prophecy important to understand? According to the Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy by J. Barton Payne, there are 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament and 578 prophecies in the New Testament for a total of 1,817 prophecies. These prophecies are contained in 8,352 of the Bible verses. Since there are 31,124 verses in the Bible, the 8,352 verses that contain prophecy constitute 26.8% of the Bible's volume. Almost one third of the Bible is prophetic. And in Revelation 19, we read the following. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We're told not to despise prophecy. Prophecy is not meant to scare you, but prepare you, I hear said over and over again. And, and, and that is so true. You know, we read the following from the CBN website. Down through history, God provided us a roadmap. He foretold various signs and conditions through his prophets. These prophets spoke of things that mankind should watch for so that the Messiah would be recognized and believed. These signs or prophecies were given to us in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the part of the Bible written before Jesus was born. Its writings were completed in 450 BC. The Old Testament written hundreds of years before Jesus' birth contains over 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled through his life death, and resurrection. Mathematically speaking, the odds of any one fulfilling the amount of prophecy are staggering. Mathematicians put it this way. One person fulfilling eight prophecies is one in 100 quadrillion. And I had to look that up because I've never counted that high. One person fulfilling 48 prophecies is one chance in 10 to the 157th power one person fulfilling 300 plus prophecies, only Jesus. It is the magnificent detail of these prophecies that mark the Bible as the inspired word of God. Only God could foreknow and accomplish all that was written about the Christ. 
This historical accuracy and reliability sets the Bible apart from any other book or record. The New Testament was written after the death of Jesus Christ. Archaeologists have found thousands of manuscripts of the New Testament. Some of these pieces of manuscript are dated less than 100 years after the original letters were written. In terms of historical reliability, the Bible is superior to any other ancient writing, as you'll see in a moment. I wanted to bring you to how I found out that the that many zeros after 100 was 100 quadrillion. I hope that's what I said, because that's what I meant. Um, so that's 15 zeros after that 100 is 100 quadrillion. Let me put it in perspective for you. So we have billion with nine zeros. We have trillion with 12 zeros. And quadrillion is 15 zeros. I have never even heard of quad quantillion with 18 zeros. But that's to put it in perspective that what we read over here, that one person fulfilling eight prophecies, only eight, just eight, one person to fulfill eight prophecies is one in 100 quadrillion. Wow. That, that's pretty amazing. But Jesus did more than that. It was 300 plus. Okay, so that you put it in perspective. I want to show you this chart now. I, I had to screenshot this from Dr. Woods, um, pastor who uh, taught on this. I think he's a brilliant man and a man of God. And he um, got this, he puts down underneath where he got the information from. Um, but it's, it's important for you to see this. Now, certain historical accounts are taught of as fact in the schools that our children go to, right? And I didn't know that many of the things that they got their information from to write these historic history books um, were written like the distance of time from when it happened or when it was written to when, um, the distance of time from when it happened to when it was written is very huge. There's a wide gap. And you will see when you compare and contrast, as I am a, a fan of charts, that when it comes to the Bible, the Bible is, is written and the manuscripts found, um, though copies of the actual uh, first manuscript, original manuscript, um, close to the time that they were written. So when you, when you look at this and you can pause to look at the rest of it, the Bible is more credible than many of the history books and the writings in it that are taught of as fact in the schools. And yet those who come against the truth of the Bible, you see why, the why behind it. Um, the enemy of humanity is called the father of lies for a reason. And he influences, our battle is not against flesh and blood. He influences a lot of these liars that come against the truth. They don't want you to believe the truth. So even if you told them one plus one is two, they're going to argue it. And with clever words, remember, there's a reason uh, when they teach you in debate class that clever words used properly, you can, um, you can convince somebody that a lie is the truth. So you have to be really careful. And, and I, the way that I tell many people, and a good pastor once told me this, and I've kept it to heart, is you either believe the Bible or you don't, but if you say you believe it, dig your heels, root yourself in it. Um, stand firm, nothing wavering on what God said, and let God be true and every man a liar. Why? Because you're going to come across many words. The enemy likes to play on words. And if you give him a foothold, he will take you, he will confuse you, and he will make you doubt what God said. And so you have to be really careful. Study, like we're told to study. Rightly divide. Um, Isaiah 28, 9 and 10 gives us instructions on how we come to understand doctrine. Um, you know, when we, when we take the Bible and we follow the instructions and with a humble heart approach it and ask Holy Spirit to give us understanding, you cannot go wrong. It's when a person is filled with pride and they want to take scripture and they want to apply it to misinterpretations. And that would mean taking scripture out of context, twisting and bending script, scripture to try to force it to agree with misinterpretations. You have to be really careful. If you say you have faith, stand firm, nothing wavering on what God has said. So we come to this section here. Is there proof other than the Bible that Jesus actually existed? Many times you will come across an atheist Oh, Jesus never really existed. Well, let me tell you. 
It shows their lack of knowing. They did not study. They did not research because had they researched the non-biblical accounts from even the Lord's enemies, they would easily see that Jesus did in fact exist a 100% yes to that question. So I'm probably going to mispronounce these names and I apologize. Um, but the one of the accounts is Tacitus or more formally Caius Gaius, sorry if I mispronounced, or Publius, Cornelius Tacitus, uh, 55, 56 um, to 118 CE, um, was a Roman senator, orator, and ethnographer, and arguably the best of Roman historians. His name is based on the Latin word Tacitus, silent, from which we get the English word tacit. Interestingly, his compact prose uses silence and implications in a masterful way. One argument for the authenticity of the quotation below is that it is written in true Tacitian Latin. But first, a short introduction. Tacitus' last major work titled Annals, um, written 116 to 117 CE, includes a biography of Nero. In 64 CE, during a fire in Rome, Nero was suspected of secretly ordering the burning of a part of town where he wanted to carry out a building project. So he tried to shift the blame to the Christians. This was the occasion for Tacitus to mention Christians whom he despised. This is what he wrote. The following ex excerpt is translated from Latin by Robert Van Voorst. Tacit Confirmation. Roman historian Tacitus, last major work, Annals mentions a Christus who was executed by Pontius Pilate and from whom the Christians derived their name. Um, just a side note, uh, the Bible does say that he was executed by Pontius Pilate um, from the push from the Jews. Tacitus' brief references corroborates, reference corroborates historical details of Jesus' death from the New Testament. The pictured volume of Tacitus' works is from the turn of the 17th century. The volume's title page features Plantin Press's printing, Mark depicting angels, a compass, and the motto, Labori et Constantia. I'm not going to butcher this further. I'll let you pause to read the rest. We continue reading. Neither human effort nor the emperor's generosity nor the placating of the gods ended the scandalous belief that the fire had been ordered by Nero. Therefore, to put down the rumor, Nero substituted as culprits and punished in the most unusual ways those hated for the shameful acts whom the crowd called Christians. The founder of his, this name, Christ, Christus in Latin, had been executed in the reign of Tiberius by the procurator Pontius Pilate. Suppressed for a time, the deadly superstition erupted again, not only in Judea, the origins of this evil, but also in the city Rome, where all things horrible and shameful from everywhere come together and become popular. Tacitus terse statement about Christus clearly corroborates the New Testament on certain historical details of Jesus' death. Tacitus presents four pieces of accurate knowledge about Jesus Christus used by Tacitus to refer to Jesus was one distinctive way by which some refer to him, even though Tacitus mistakenly took it for a personal time rather than an epithet or title. This Christus was associated with the beginning of the movement of Christians whose name originated from, the, from his. He was executed by the Roman governor of Judea, and the time of death was during Pontius Pilate's governorship of Judea during the reign of Tiberius. Um, many New Testament scholars date Jesus' death to 29 CE. Um, Pilate governed Judea in 26 to 36 CE, while Tiberius was emperor 14 to 37 CE. So we read about um, the evidence from uh, Tacitus. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to see the website so I can give proper credit. And I'm sure I put it in here somewhere, so forgive me. I'm going to hopefully um, put it in the details if it's not on here. Um, so let's see, this is the same one that we read. Um, but here's another one. Evidence from Pliny the Younger. 
and I'm probably mispronouncing these again, I apologize. Another important source of evidence about Jesus and early Christianity can be found in the letters of Pliny the Younger to Emperor Trajan. Pliny was the Roman governor of Bith Bithynia in Asia Minor. In one of his letters, dated around AD 112, he asks Trajan's advice about the appropriate way to conduct legal proceedings against those accused of being Christians. Pliny says that he, consult, he needed to consult the emperor about this issue because a great multitude of every age, class, and sex stood accused of Christianity. At one point, his letter, Pliny, in his letter, Pliny relates some of the information he has learned about these Christians. They were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang in alternate verses a, a hymn to Christ as to a God and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to, not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up, after the, which is after it, which it was their custom to separate and then uh, reassemble to partake of food, but food at an ordinary and innocent kind. Do you see what they had against them? Do you see that, that they described them as, what should I do with these Christians? You know, what are they guilty of? Well, they sang hymns to Jesus, <laughs> to Christ. You know, um, they bound themselves by a solemn oath, not to any wicked deeds, never to commit any fraud theft or adultery, never to falsify their word. Why is this a problem? Like, do you understand? More and more in this world, evil is called good, good is called evil. And you've got to understand and see what's happening. Um, so one of my favorite accounts is from uh, Josephus. So we read, perhaps the most remarkable reference to Jesus outside the Bible can be found in the writings of Josephus, a first century Jewish historian. On two occasions in his Jewish antiquities, he mentions Jesus. The second less revealing reference um, describes the condemnation of one James by the Jewish Sahedrin. This James, says jo Josephus, was the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ. Um, so Bruce, F. F. Bruce points out how this agrees with Paul's description of James in Galatians 1.19 as the Lord's brother. And Edwin Yamwaki, sorry, informs us that few scholars have questioned that Josephus actually penned this passage. As interesting as this brief reference is, there is an earlier one, which is truly astonishing, calling the, called the Testimonium Flavianum, the relevant portion declares about this time there lived Jesus a wise man if indeed one ought to call him a man for he wrought surprising feats he was the Christ when Pilate condemned him to be crucified those who had come to love him did not give up their affection for him on the third day he appeared restored to life and the tribe of Christians has not disappeared so you see, I, would, I want to tell you something right now. So you hear that a later, a later account from Josephus, um, most scholars agree. But then you have those who will fight because of what this says. Remember, you are always going to come across those who argue against the truth. You are always going to have those influenced by the father of lies who do not want you to have anything tangible that might sway you away from the wide gate and broad way that leads toward destruction. And it is up to you, human, to make a decision on what you believe by properly studying independently. independently. The Bible says, knock and it shall be opened. Seek and you shall find. And it is important that every person understand your walk in this life, in this short life that you're given that is described as a vapor of smoke, in this temporary existence that you have, that you have air in your lungs, your walk should be your own. You should not be a puppet tied with unseen strings um, that somebody is trying to sway you against Christ who they don't even know. You need to search for yourself because after your last breath, those people who have influenced you, influenced you away from the truth, they're not taking the cross into the unknown with you after your last breath. 
This is your decision. Every individual has to make the decision on their own. They have to think for themselves and stop letting people think for you. It's time for you to go in the driver's seat and, and seek the truth. Invest in your eternal life. Many people will invest in this temporary existence in this short life that we're given here on earth, this temporary existence, but they will not in, in, invest in their eternal home. And I'm telling you, it's important to wake up and do it now. Why? Because we are seeing signs that the end of this age is approaching. We are seeing signs that Jesus left us that, show, that tell us that his return is near. The next segment of time that comes, you don't want to be here for that time. That seven-year period, you don't want to be here for that time. Evil incarnate will be on the earth. Hell will spill over onto the earth. You do not want to be here for that time. All right. So we have evidence from the Babylonian Talmud. Um, there are only a few clear references to Jesus in the ba Babylonian Talmud. <clears throat> Here's the website, bethinking.org. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, we're going to read, there are only a few clear references to Jesus in the Babylonian Talmud. A collection of Jewish rabbinical writings compiled between approximately AD 70 to 500, given this time frame, it is naturally supposed that earlier references to Jesus are more likely to be historically reliable than later ones. In the case of the Talmud, the earliest period of compilation occurred between AD 70 to 200. The most significant reference to Jesus from the period states, on the eve of the Passover, Yeshu was hanged. For 40 days before the execution took place, a herald cried, he is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Of course, you know that those original writers and anything from uh, Babylonian is going to be tinged with a little bit of, there are just things that I've read um, and not to offend anyone um, that you can see the dislike of Christ from this book. Um, but the point of the matter is, and the reason for referencing it is because Jesus existed, even his enemies spoke of him. And they didn't know it back then, but they would testify to the truth that he existed. So in bethinking.org, we continue reading, let's examine the passage. You may have noticed that it refers to someone named Yeshu, so why do we think this is Jesus? Actually, Yeshu or Yeshua is how Jesus' name is pronounced in Hebrew. But what does the passage mean by saying that Jesus was hanged? Doesn't the New Testament say that he was crucified? Indeed it does. But the term hanged can function as a synonym for crucified. For instance, Galatians 3.13 declares that Christ was hanged. And Luke 23.39 applies this term to the criminals who were crucified with Jesus. So the Talmud declares that Jesus was crucified on the eve of Passover. But what of the cry of the herald that Jesus was to be stoned? This may simply indicate that the Jewish leaders were planning to do, what the Jewish leaders were planning to do, excuse me. If so, Roman involvement changed their, changed their plans. The passage also tells us why Jesus was crucified. It claims he practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Since this accusation comes from a rather hostile source, we should not be too surprised if Jesus is described somewhat differently than in the New Testament. But, it, but if we make allowances for this, that might, what might such charges imply about Jesus? Um, I wanna let you know if you're an unbeliever and you're watching this video, that in Israel today, according to Romans 11, we have a remnant who have finally accepted their promised Messiah. They are under grace, of which the apostle Paul was one of them. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. But there are, excuse me, those in Israel today who are in temporary spiritual blindness because of unbelief. Um, that remnant from Israel of the 12 tribes are blinded for unbelief, but because the Lord has promised their forefathers that, he will, that all Israel will be saved, speaking of Jacob and the 12 tribes, 
for them, the Lord has a plan. He is going to cast them in that seven year period. Um, he is going to um, force them into a belief in Christ through what they go through. They are going to endure a time called the time of Jacob's trouble during the great tribulation, during that 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. And, and the things that they go through there and the two witnesses which will be on the earth um, having the same power that Moses and Elijah did and the things that they speak and they say along with what these, this remnant blinded sees um, when they see the Antichrist figure break the covenant in the middle of that seven year time and declare that he is God, which is a problem that they had with Jesus. After all that, the two witnesses and what the Antichrist does, they are going to have the blindfold removed and they're going to weep. Um, Zechariah 12, 10 says, uh, for the one that their ancestors pierced. So God has a plan and his plan is perfect and it's laid out in the Bible by way of prophecies. And when we see everything that happens, we come to understand um, that God is not done with the people of Israel. So, um, forgive me. So the apostasy that those blinded, that their ancestors even believe um, today that they, don't, they reject the, that remnant that is blinded of the children of Israel, of the 12 tribes, the remnant blinded that lives in Israel and rejects Jesus, they still do so today. But for them, there is a plan, a plan of God to um, have them endure a furnace of affliction that is the time of Jacob's trouble during that seven-year period in order to open their eyes. Um, but they will be kept safe during that time is what the Bible says. Okay, let's continue reading. Since this accusation comes from a rather hostile source, we should not be too surprised if Jesus is described somewhat differently than in the New Testament. But if we make allowances for this, what might such charges imply about Jesus? Okay, so here's another um, non-biblical source um, that we read about Christ. Lucian of Samosata, sorry, was a second century Greek satirist, 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 I'm sure that I'm saying that wrong. Um, in one of his works, he wrote of the early Christians as follows. The Christians worship a man to this day. The distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. It was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers from the, from that, from the moment that they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. So this is another non-biblical account that yes, Jesus in fact did exist as a real um, uh, Messiah and, and what he did on the earth, um, he still has followers till this day. He is still the son of the living God. He is still seated above all and has all under his feet. He still has authority over heaven and, and, and earth. There's a reason why when people were possessed and he was able to just speak directly to the, to the demon and cast them out by the words that he spoke, um, even the demons did fear him. So you have to understand the power of the living God and who Jesus is and all that people, his followers, are able to do with his name, which has power. Although Lucian is jesting here at the early Christians, he does make some significant comments about their founder. For instance, he says the Christians worshipped a man who introduced their novel rites. And though this man's followers clearly thought quite highly of him, he so angered many of his contemporaries uh, with his teaching that he was crucified on that account. So now let's talk about the DNA molecule. Um, I am uh, just astonished with everything that is coming to light, uh, more and more things that are shocking um, some of the greatest minds on the earth right now. And so I got this article from everystudent.com. Is God real? They make some really great points. Science gives ample reason to believe in God. Why is DNA important? We read, British philosopher Dr. Anthony Flew was a leading spokesperson for atheism, actively involved in debate after debate. However, scientific discoveries within the last 30 years brought him to a conclusion he could not avoid. In a video interview in December 2004, he stated, 
super intelligence is the only good explanation for the origin of life and the complexity of nature. Prominent in his conclusion were the discoveries of DNA. Here's why. DNA in our cells is very similar to an intricate computer program. In the photo on the left, and I'm sorry, I didn't include that photo. Um, you see that a computer program is made up of a series of ones and zeros called binary code. The sequencing and ordering of these ones and zeros is what makes the computer program work properly. In that same way, DNA is made up of four chemicals, abbreviated as letters, A, T, G, and C. Much like the ones and zeros, these letters are arranged in the human cell like this, and I'm going to let you go through it, and so on. The order in which they are arranged instructs the cell's actions. What is amazing is that within the tiny space in every cell in your body, this code is three billion letters long. To grasp the amount of DNA information in one cell, a live reading of that code at a rate of three letters per second would take 31 years, even if reading uh, continued day and night. Wait, there's more. It has been determined that 99.9% .9 of your DNA is similar to everyone's genetic makeup. What is uniquely you comes in the fractional difference in how those three billion letters are sequenced in your cells. The U.S. government is able to identify everyone in our country by the arrangement of a nine-digit social security number. Yet inside every cell in you is a three billion letter DNA structure that belongs only to you. This code identifies you and continually instructs your cell's behavior. You can see why DNA is important. Dr. Francis Collins, director of the Human Genome Project that mapped the human DNA structure, said that one can think of DNA as an instructional, instructional script, a software program sitting in the nucleus of the cell. Perry Marshall, an information specialist, comments on the implications of this. There has never existed a computer program that, was des that wasn't designed, whether it is a code, or a program or a message given through a language. There is always an intelligent mind behind it. Just as former atheist Dr. Anthony Flew questioned, it is legitimate to ask oneself regarding this, this three billion letter code instructing the cell. Who wrote the script? Who placed this working code inside the cell? It's like walking along the beach and you see in the sand, Mike loves Michelle. You know the waves rolling up on the beach didn't form that. A person wrote that. It is a precise message. It is clear communication in the same way the DNA structure is a complex three billion lettered script informing and directing the cell's process. How can one explain this sophisticated messaging coding residing in our cells? On June 26, 2000, President Clinton congratulated those who completed the human genome sequencing. President Clinton said, today we are learning the language in which God created life. We are gaining ever more awe for the complexity, the beauty, the wonder of God's most divine and sacred gift. Dr. Francis Collins, director of the Human Genome Project, followed Clinton to the podium stating, it is humbling for me and awe-inspiring to realize that we have caught the first glimpse of our own instruction book previously known only to God. When looking at the DNA structure within the human body, we cannot escape the presence of intelligence, incredibly intelligent design. According to the Bible, which is itself incredibly complex, God is not only the author of our existence, but he is the relationship that makes our existence meaningful. All the intangibles in life that we crave, enough strength for any situation, joy, wisdom, and knowing we are loved, God alone gives these to us as we listen to him and trust him. He is our greatest reliable guide in life. Just as he has engineered DNA to instruct the cell, he offers to instruct us to make our lives function well for his glory, for our sake, because he loves us. Why is DNA important? It's more proof for God. He designed our bodies. He can also be trusted to design your life. Have you ever begun a relationship with God? This explains how you can. And I'm sorry, I, you can probably go on that website, which is again, um, uh, 
everystudent.com is God real and you can finish reading it and click on the link that they have for information. Um, I got the following from evo2.org. It's very simple. Messages, languages, and coded information only come from a mind. A mind that agrees on an alphabet and a meaning of words and sentences. A mind that expresses both desire and intent. When I use the simplest possible explanation, such as the one I'm giving you here, or if we analyze language with advanced mathematics and engineering communication theory, we can say this with total confidence. Messages, languages, and coded information never ever come from anything else besides a mind. No one has ever produced a single example of a message that did not come from a mind. Nature can create um, fascinating patterns, snowflakes, sand dunes, um, crystals, stalagmites, and stalactites, tornadoes, and turbulence, and cloud formations. But non-living things cannot create language. They cannot create codes. Rocks cannot think. They cannot talk. And they cannot create information. It is believed by some that life on planet Earth arose accidentally from the prim primordial soup, the early ocean, which produced enzymes and eventually RNA, DNA, and primitive cells. But there is still a problem with this theory. It fails to answer the question, where did the information come from? DNA is not merely a molecule, nor is it simply a pattern. Yes, it contains chemicals and proteins, but those chemicals are arranged to form an intricate language in the exact same way that English and Chinese and HTML are languages. DNA has a four-letter alphabet and structures very similar to words, sentences, and paragraphs with very precise instructions and systems that check for errors and correct them. It is formally and scientifically a code. All codes we know the origin of are designed. To the person who says that life arose naturally, you need only ask, where did the information come from? Show me just one example of a language that, did come, that didn't come from a mind. As simple as this question is, I've personally presented it in public presentations and, in, and internet discussions forums for more than four years. I've addressed more than 100,000 people, including hostile, skeptical audiences who insist that life arose without the assistance of God. But to a person, none of them have ever been able to explain where the information came from. This riddle is so simple any child can understand. It's so complex no atheist can, no atheist can solve. Now, and again, that is from evo2.org um, when speaking of um, how DNA proves God as well. Now you will come against those who speak clever words and are going to try to convince you that all this is a lie. Again, you have a choice to make. You have a choice to make on credible truth versus um, lies with an agenda. And you, fellow human, have a decision to make. Um, you either make God the creator of all your father while incarnate on the earth, or you will make the father of lies, who is a created being, your father, and you will follow him to his doom, eternal doom. Um, so now I want to go ahead and switch to the website godandscience.org. Here's some of the most brilliant minds. Um, have left us quotes, and whether they were believers or not, many of them were not, um, they left us quotes that they could not argue against intelligent design because of their, um, their own branch of study. And so here, um, Fred Hoyle, a British astrophysicist, wrote, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics, as well as with chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. And so um, you can pause this and read, uh, I'll, I'll just read a few of them. Um, Alan Sandage, winner of the Crawford Prize in astronomy, he wrote, I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle. God to me is a mystery. 
but is the explanation for the miracle of existence, why there is something instead of nothing. In John uh, O'Keefe, astronomer of NASA, at NASA, we are, by astronomical standards, a pampered, cosseted, cherished group of creatures. If the universe had not been made with the most exacting precision, we could never have come into existence. It is my view that these circumstances indicate the universe was created for man to live in. Um, let's see, you can pause this again. I'm looking for one specific one. Um, let's see, oh, Frank Tipler, here we go. So Frank Tipler is a professor of mathematical physics. And he wrote, when I began my career as a cosmologist some 20 years ago, I was a convinced atheist. I never in my wildest dreams imagined that one day I would be writing a book purporting to show that the central claims of Judeo-Christian theology are in fact true, that these claims are straightforward deductions of the laws of physics as we now understand them. I have been forced into these conclusions by the inexplorable logic of my own special branch of physics. And then there's a note, Tipler since has, has actually converted to Christianity, hence his latest books, book uh, during this time that it was um, added on this website, The Physics of Christianity. I would like to get that book. I keep saying it. I have to make a note for myself to go ahead and do it. You can pause and read the rest of these. These are amazing um, quotes from some of the brightest minds on earth and, and, and their inability to um, speak against intelligent design. Frank Tipler again, professor of mathematic physics wrote, from the perspective of the latest physical theories, Christianity is not a mere religion, but an experimentally testable science. I love that, that was incredible. So here in 1 John 5, 7, we read the following. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And the reason I added this on here is many people um, have questioned, well, how is Jesus both God and the Son of God um, and the Word? It doesn't make any sense. It's too complex, yada, yada. Um, I want to refer you to John 14, and I'm trying to remember what verse it is. And I know it begins with, at that day. Um, and what you need to understand is this question that, that, is, that is posed time and time again. We can read what we are given in the Bible, but I try not to fill in the blanks because that's when we get into error. We're not asked to fill in the blanks. We're asked to read the Bible with a humble heart, study, rightly divide, take precip upon precip, which means order, line upon line, here a little, there a little, and gather the information that we're given, asking Holy Spirit to help us understand which is our most perfect um, uh, and holiest of teachers. And so what I can answer to the question that is posed is this. The Bible says we serve one God who is three parts. Father, and we know that God the Father is a spirit, we're told. The Word, um, which is also the Son, and that is Jesus. And the Holy Ghost, which we, we read is the breath of God, and so much more. And these are one. And how can we, what in the Bible will help us at least somewhat understand that? Because we know that in John 14, it says at that time, that time that Jesus comes for us to take us to the place at his father's house at the time of the rapture, um, we will understand how we are in him, he in us, and, you know, um, and God is in him as well, and God in us. So we'll understand that, and I'm paraphrasing, at the time of the rapture with 100% clarity. Right now, um, we are we know in part and we prophesy in part well when that which is perfect is come which is Jesus then that which is in part shall be done away we understand what is in the Bible for us to understand and this is what we know we serve one God who is three parts Jesus while he was on earth prayed to the father um, John uh, the Baptist when he baptized Jesus he saw the Holy Spirit descending as a dove and he heard the voice of God in heaven so there is something tangible about the three parts, God who has the power to separate himself into three parts. Um, and I believe a, a big deal with that is if we saw God in his fullness with all three parts as one, we would die. We cannot 
handle that. And every account that you read in the Old Testament, remember, you read the word of God presented himself, the word of God, you know, and who is the word of God? We've already learned that's Jesus, the word of God, the word became flesh. There is something distinct about the word of God. Remember what a son is. Our children come from our insides. So the ins from the inside of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, came Jesus. You know, he is the word of God of which God speaks things into existence. And we are made in the image of God. You know, remember that in Genesis 1.26, we read, and God said, let us, plural, make man in our, plural, but image is singular, after our, plural, likeness. So we know that according to 1 Thessalonians 5.23, every human is one human made up of three parts. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. We read the following. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and many, many times uh, in the past, I thought the spirit and the soul uh, were one and the same. But the spirit and the soul are spoken as distinct. Um, here, we also read that the word of God is sharper than any, than any two-edged sword, um, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, able to get in between the soul and spirit, which is otherwise indistinguishable. Um, to us, we can't understand it. The word of God is so powerful to reach the deepest level of a human being to get between the soul and the spirit. The soul and the spirit is eternal. Um, in my opinion, from the little that I have studied, um, it would appear to me, remember that um, when God breathed life into Adam, he became a living soul. Um, we know that um, the spirit, it, it, a certain scriptures seem to imply that the spirit has to do a lot with the emotion. And so when you have um, deceiving spirits dirtying uh, your temple because of things you have done, sin allows an open door for um, the enemy's um, spirits to influence your behavior, to, to, to lie, to confuse you, to um, act in rage and hate. And, you know, those emotional tied things, I believe, are the condition of the spirit. Um, you will know them by their fruit. What do you have in your temple? Have you somehow allowed um, the enemy's lying spirits in by your actions? Um, have you given in to Satan and his temptation um, instead of rejecting it? Um, there are things that allow for the condition of the human spirit to manifest in certain symptoms. Um, and that's what I believe uh, is the difference. You know, the soul, uh, we became a living soul to the breath of God. Um, the Holy Spirit is the Ruach of God, the breath of God, but he is so much more. Remember that the, the, the thing being done on the earth is not by power, not by might, but by God's spirit. The Holy Spirit is here doing a tremendous work as he has sealed and now indwells into the body of every believer in Christ. We have become the holy temple of God, and it's a spiritual understanding. You cannot try to understand those, those truths from heaven with a flesh-filled understanding. You need the Holy Spirit to be able to understand these things. Oh, so let me read 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly in your wholeness. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I just remembered I did read it. Okay. So what do we do? What do we do at this point with all this truth, all this information that we've given? Well, if you are a person that it does not know Christ, it's time to get into the ark now. And look at Jesus as that ark. You know, at the time of the flood, um, people we read were marrying and giving in marriage, living life normally. And then the flood came and they were swept away. Many of them made fun of Noah when he would try to warn them. Um, many of them uh, didn't understand what was happening and Noah tried to tell them um, a judgment was coming. Um, God had had enough and they ignored it. And the time of the flood, when the door was closed, and those who were righteous, uh, who the Lord put inside the ark, were in the safety of the ark. I'll bet you many people believed it then when they saw the flood. And they wanted to go in, but it was too late. The flood doors, the, the doors to the ark were closed. In the same manner, that is what I see is going to happen in that seven-year period that is the Great Tribulation. Many of those who have heard the gospel and rejected it, many of those who didn't want anything to do with Jesus, they liked their, their flesh life more. They wanted to live life anyway without restriction, doing anything they wanted. 
And though their creator told them how he wanted them to live, and he warned of a global flood, um, uh, I'm sorry, a, a global punishment that was yet to come, uh, and an evil dictator, that a global evil dict dictator that would be here too, that's the Antichrist beast system, um, people are ignoring it. People make fun of it, and which is prophecy also. There are many who make fun of Christians. Oh, look what you believe. You're, you're believing in an imaginary God. Though all this proof exists in their blind state, they would prefer to listen to the enemy, the father of lies, because he's giving them the words that they want to hear to live any way they want to live. That's not what our creator put us on this earth to do. Because then when you're living any way you want to live, you are hurting others. You are also um, uh, defiling yourself. You don't see in the unseen how many spirits you are letting in your body to the point where you begin to resemble the fruits of the enemy, the father of lies, the enemy of humanity. Now is the time that you want to accept Christ. Now is the time of salvation. All signs, uh, uh, prophetic signs, um, point to the soon return of Jesus Christ. On a global level, never have we seen what's happening today. There are wars and rumors of wars, um, earthquakes in diverse places, um, pestilence, plagues on a global level. There are things happening, sinkholes opening up, um, volcanoes that were dormant for thousands of years uh, waking up all of a sudden. There are so many things happening. Jesus is coming soon. Now is the time to accept him. You know, remember in Acts 2, 8, what, 2 38, what we read, then Peter said unto, the, unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Romans 10, 9 to 10, we read that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You know, I included the sinner's prayer this is just a simple uh, prayer that I like to include. For those that are interested in now receiving God, don't wait, don't wait. Um, you want to be sealed in the unseen as, as, as belonging to Jesus. You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and given power. This world is a spiritual battlefield and you need protection. You need salvation from what's coming, the global judgment that is at the door. And this is the way you do it. Um, you know, you, you, when you have decided in your heart, you know what? I, I want to accept Jesus. I want him to be Lord and Savior of my life. Um, you want to go in the privacy of your room. Nothing fancy, fancy has to be done. There's no ceremonial thing that you have to do. All you have to do is come with a humble heart, meaning it in your heart. Go to the privacy of your room. If you have a prayer closet, go there. Kneel before the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, I come to you in prayer, asking for the forgiveness of my sins. I confess with my mouth and believe with my heart that Jesus is your son and that he died on the cross at Calvary, that I might be forgiven and have eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. Father, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead and I ask you right now to come into my life and be my personal Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins and will worship you all the days of my life because your word is truth. I confess with my mouth that I am born again and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we, when we come to Christ as a baby Christian, I would recommend you find a church that is born again, that does full immersion baptism. There is a huge confusion about baptism. Nothing that our Lord told us to do is written as optional or unimportant. I believe with all my heart, if it's written in the Bible, it's written with great purpose and reason. And the Lord has said that what he has spoken, none of it will return to him void. And it's not about arguing and saying that, oh, you don't need um, to be baptized to be saved. It's not about that is that we are followers of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, as the perfect lamb without spot, spot or blemish, who didn't need to get baptized, he did it. And he said, we must fulfill all righteousness. That's what he said. And so it's important if it's in the Bible, because nothing in the Bible was written as unimportant or idle. And so if you are a baby Christian and you have just done this prayer and you have 
called Jesus in your life, welcome to the family of God. You have brothers and sisters who love you. Um, you know, there, there is so much right now that the body of Christ could be doing if they just get out of their own way. There are prideful people, wolves in sheep clothing, false preachers and false preachers to contend with. How do we filter through it all? How can we tell somebody telling the truth from somebody not telling the truth through knowing the word? The more you dive into the word, the more you learn the truth, the more you have a basis, a foundation, which is Christ, to be able to um, um, discern between those speaking against the truth. So I would recommend to you, baby Christian, if you're looking, if you're, if you're viewing this video, you have found your way to this video, I would recommend to you that you um, find a church, a Christian church that, that is born again, that does full immersion baptism in Jesus' name. You get baptized and you find yourself a holy Bible you can understand. Listen, I, when I was a baby Christian, I had an NLT version. That is what helped me understand. I did not at that time understand the KJV. As you grow from milk to meat, in my humble opinion, and you're able to understand it, then of course, go ahead and take the KJV. I love the KJV right now. I am one that, um, you know, I, I tried to study where the Bibles came from, what manuscript interpretations they used. And the KJV um, uh, agrees with the majority uh, of the manuscripts that were found on what is truth. Um, I would do a study, do your study. I know many people are against that, but I prefer the KJV. If you can understand the KJV, then amen. If not, I have used the NLT when I was a baby Christian. And as I grew, because this walk with Christ is, is one where you will grow from milk to meat in your understanding, um, then I, I began to go with the KJV. And I understood it well, and I understand it well, and I prefer it, to be honest. Um, so that is my two cents worth. So next, you want to share the good news. Jesus died. He died so, to save. He died so that um, um, those who accepted the free gift um, would not have to suffer what Satan has prepared for them. And so that's what sharing the gospel means. Share the good news, good news of salvation. Jesus died for you. He loves you. Um, come follow him. You know, and you want to keep spreading because the time is, is you know, I, I truly believe Jesus is at the, at the door according to the prophecies that we read. Now I want to show you and end with this. These are some accounts of people that after having died 45 minutes came back to life when somebody prayed for them. Um, this is, has happened in our time. This one uh, happened six years ago. There are some from 2014, 2015. Um, there's one, I, and I forgot to add it. Um, there's a woman, I'm trying to remember her name, forgive me. Oh, maybe I'll link it in the bottom if I remember. Um, this just happened last year, and she died, and she came back and uh, um, said she was given uh, um, um, a job to do to tell people Jesus is coming soon. Um, she died and she came back to life. Listen, I have a, a medical background and I can tell you that I didn't take these near-death experiences lightly. If I didn't hear the extraordinary testimony they came back with, they're not speaking against Christ, they're speaking for Christ. Um, there have been atheists that died and came back a Christian. Who can do that but God? And so I don't discount these because God raises the dead and he is still in the business of miracles if you believe, if you have faith. So here we have um, a Fox 4 newsroom report six years ago. Man comes back to life after being clinically dead for 45 minutes. Why is that so, so extraordinary? Well, because um, uh, if you go and research, I believe it's, and, and forgive me if I have it wrong, but it's a shorter time than 45 minutes for certain. Um, I believe it's six minutes that a human being can go without um, oxygen before irreversible brain damage. 
um, and you can research that. So here we read Beechwood, Ohio, a man who essentially came back to life after his heart stopped for nearly 45 minutes is now telling the story of his astounding near, near death experience. And you can look that up. I didn't get the deep. Well, I, actually, I did. I'm sorry. According to Fox Wars sister station, Fox 8 in Cleveland, Brian Miller suffered a massive heart attack and and seemed fine until the next day when he began experiencing ventricular fibrillation, which is a usually deadly fluttering pattern of the heart where blood is no longer being pumped through the body. Without treatment, the condition can kill a person in just a few minutes. After about 45 minutes of Miller being without a heart rate, pulse, blood pressure, or oxygen to his brain, he miraculously awoke with a regular heartbeat and without any, any damage to his brain. Miller said he had beautiful visions of the afterlife as he walked toward heaven, which included both flowers and light. He said he had a loved one who had recently passed tell him he needed to go back. Um, here's one from the Christian Poll, stated uh, August 22nd, uh, 2013. Doctor declares miracle after father dead for 45 minutes wakes up when son prays and screams, you're not going to die today. Um, a doctor at the Kettering Medical Center in Ohio pronounced a miracle this month after a man he had declared dead for 45 minutes came back to life after the man's 17-year-old son prayed over his lifeless body and screamed, you're not going to die today. Here's another one uh, from God Reports. Miracle mom returns from the dead, saw a glimpse of the afterlife. Uh, this is dated November 11th, 2014. Medical personnel pumped her chest for 45 minutes and tried shocking her heart with electrical stimulation, but it was to no avail. She was clinically dead and placed on a ventilator for over three hours. Ashen-faced Dr. Flight Fly, Fleischer, Fleischer, sorry, informed her family there was little chance she would survive and brought the family into the operating room to say goodbye. There her mother cried out to God, please take me instead. Ruby's sister hugged her one last time. There was nothing more that could be done by the doctors in human terms than record her time of death. Once we say that's it, that's it, anesthesiologist Dr. Anthony Salvatore uh, told the Sentinel, her family went to another room and began to pray fervently to God, with some holding hands and others on their knees. As they prayed, crying out to the, to the throne of grace, something amazing happened. A faint heartbeat appeared on the monitor. There, more and more, then more and more heartbeats began to appear, like raindrops from heaven. Nurse Claire Hansen rushed out of the operating room and excited informed Ruby's family, keep praying because her heart just started. The family screamed, began to jump up and down and cry. Ruby's sister ran back to the operating room. Ruby woke up in ICU the next day, wondering why voices were telling her to open her eyes. Then she saw her family crying and relatives had arrived from Miami. She realized something must have gone wrong. In the next few hours, Ruby was able to recall a powerful dream or vision in which she spoke to her late father, who told her it wasn't her time. Whether a dream or a vision in the body or out of a body, she wasn't completely sure. If you remember, that's what Paul said in, I think it was 2 Corinthians 12. When Dr. Fleischer took her off the breathing tube, Ruby told him, you don't have to be afraid of dying. In her near-death experience, God bolstered bolstered her faith. A few days later, Ruby went home making a full recovery without any brain damage from loss of circulation. Living for 45 minutes without a pulse in it is extremely rare, doctors noted. There were no burns from the electrical shocks delivered to her heart. There were not even any bruises from the chest compressions. God held her in the palm of his hands during her near-death experience. Here's another case where mom prays dead son uh, who comes back to life. This one is dated February 4th, 2015. A Missouri mother is saying the power of prayer brought her son back to life after he was dead for 45 minutes, but the teen didn't just survive the accident. He's thriving. Um, here's another one from Christian Post. Pastor miraculously comes back to life after dying for 15 minutes, credits power of prayer. Um, a pastor in the UK who miraculously, miraculously came back to life after being dead for 15 minutes um, has credited the power of prayer and divine providence for saving him. In November, Christopher Wicklin, pastor of Living Word Pentecostal Church in Fairham, Hampshire, was 
jumping at a trampoline park with three of his youngest children when he began vomiting and collapsed, the Daily Echo reports. Staff used a defibrillator four times to restart his heart, and he was, he was then rushed to the intensive care unit of St. Mary's Hospital, uh, Southampton. Um, there, doctors informed his wife, Tracy, that he had suffered a cardiac arrest and had died for 15 minutes. They also warned her that he could, he could suffer brain and heart damage uh, um, should he survive. Um, and you can follow up that story there. Um, I want to um, tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ dem demonstrated time and again that he raises the dead. Um, by the power of God, in Jesus' name, there is power in prayer. And time and time again, if you look at the unbiased proof that exists throughout the earth, you can't deny it. It takes more faith to not believe the truth than it does to believe the truth, which has so much proof globally, seemingly in every area of life. And so I want to read now, and we are almost done, and I apologize, uh, I am almost done with uh, this video. First Corinthians 15, 12 to 17 says the following. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ is, be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yeah, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be, that the dead raise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. We continue reading, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all, we are, of all men most miserable, if it be that he didn't rise, in other words. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man death came death, by man came also the resurrection of the death of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits afterward, they that are Christ that is uh, coming, speaking of um, the resurrection of the dead event, the rapture, um, which if you go to the rapture videos uh, on this channel, um, you will see that the rapture happens before the seven years. Um, the second coming happens after the seven years. Um, Christ in the first fruits. Um, we are the first fruits of the spirit. Uh, there is also a video where I explained um, there's a difference between those who are the first fruits of the flesh, uh, which is Israel, and those who are the first fruits of the spirit who first believed in Christ. And so Christ and the first fruits, plural, I believe is pertaining to the church, okay? Um, so these near-death experiences, I don't count, I don't discount them. There is too much good that is coming out of them. They change the person in unimaginable ways when they come back from that near-death experience and they're on a mission. They're on a mission to share their testimony with the world, to tell people many have gone to hell and they've been able to tell of the different chambers of hell and what those people are suffering and how the people plead with them. Don't let their family members come to that place. You know, there's so much that is happening today that the Lord is shaking the world. The Lord is having near-death experiences happen. The Lord is having miracle upon miracle. He is trying to get the attention of his creation to try to get you back on the path to believing in God before his judgment because he wants to save you from what is coming. Jesus is at the door right now. Now is the church age of grace. Today is the time of salvation. You want to accept him today. You never know what the next hour, the next minute, um, the next day could bring. You never know um, if Jesus could come and he finds you an unbeliever. Guess what? You're going to be cast to a seven-year time that is described as worse than ever there will be on the earth, where evil incarnate will come, where people will seek death, the Bible says, and they will not find it. You want now is the time to accept Jesus. You know, when we think of um, Peter, Peter was able to walk on water. I think of the faith that it must have taken Peter to just step out of the firmness of the boat and onto the water and, and, and in the nighttime and in a stormy uh, night at that. And so long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, he was able to walk on water. The minute that 
um, Peter took his eyes off Jesus and focused instead on the storm, making the storm around him bigger than God before him, he began to sink. And still in the midst of sinking, all he had to do was call out to Jesus. And the Bible says immediately Jesus came and saved him, albeit with a soft rebuke, why did you doubt? And so even today, I feel, you know, if you're somebody who is an unbeliever and you think you're not worthy, you think you've done too many horrible things, think of Paul. Paul, you know, because of him, there was so much bloodshed against innocent Christians. God had mercy on him and God turned him around, changed his heart and is able to use him for the kingdom and is able to use him and look at everything he wrote that is in the Bible today that helps us understand uh, more things about the kingdom. Um, so understand that if you are somebody who the only thing stopping you are the lies that the enemy is whispering to you, that you're not worthy, that you're, you're, you're not, um, God doesn't love you, that you're an exception. Listen, God died for everybody who will accept him. If you are a sinner, as we are all sinners, we have all kinds of flavors of sin. One sin is not better than the other. It's all sin. If you are a person that just hasn't come to Christ because you think you're not worthy. Those are lies from the father of lies. You are fallen. You have fallen a victim of his lies. Um, Jesus loves you and he wants to save you. Even you, he wants to save you. You're precious in the eyes of God. And so please do not let the lies of the enemy dictate um, whether or not you accept the free gift that God has for you. Um, angels rejoice in heaven over a sinner that has turned around repented and, 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 and changed their ways and accepted Christ. Um, he is the ark. You want to get in the ark right now. Um, Jesus will save you. Even you, precious soul, he wants you. He wants to save you. He loves you. He died for you. Um, so don't let the enemy's lies um, get you to um, miss this, this important time that we're living and the important offer God has made of a free gift to you. Um, so I want to close in prayer, and I thank you so much for if you're still with me. Um, let's pray. Father Almighty God, I just thank you so very much for everything you have given us today. I thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy and your truth. I thank you for loving us as imperfect as we are. We all fall short of the glory of God, and it is only by Jesus' righteousness alone that we enter into the throne of your grace. And we, we just thank you for every individual that's listening, Father. And we just pray that you send mighty angels, holy angels, warring angels with Holy Spirit fire to surround, watch over, protect, and intervene for them, Father. Guide them. I pray that you fill them with your Holy Spirit, that you give them eyes to see and ears to hear only your truth away from the lies and the confusion of the world and the enemy. I pray, Father, that the lukewarm get red hot for you. I pray, Father, that every unbeliever, that a seed has been planted and it will grow and bear fruit for you. I pray, Father, that a baby Christian will continue their walk and it will strengthen their path, Father, that they grow from milk to meat in their understanding. I just pray, Father, that you open the windows of heaven and pour out your spirit to every space, every crevice, every millimeter, every inch of this earth to do your will. May the hand of God work mightily for all your will and for your perfect glory. What the enemy intended for bad, Father, flip it in Jesus' name and make it for good. I pray, Father, I plead the blood of Christ over each and every one of us. And I just pray that you fill us with Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit fire. Jesus, enter our heart and stay there and guide us every step of the way and keep our feet firmly planted on the righteous path of your truth for all your perfect glory as we are headed toward the straight gate and narrow way that leads to life. I pray, Father, that we are accounted worthy to escape those things that are coming upon the world and to stand before the Son of Man clothed in white raiment. I thank you, Lord. I praise you. I give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all God's children say, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to, to see the, if you want to be notified of the next video. God bless you. Bye-bye.